Hello, welcome to the Lay Novella Spreet video series on the theology of the body. I am one of your co hosts, Jeremy Hansotter. And I am Guillermo Moreno. Our other co host. Correct. All right. Now, Guillermo, there was um, something you wanted to say about the theology of the body. Yes, I wanted to share that it might have surprised some of our listeners and viewers that the episode seemed, it might have seemed too short, especially for something that is supposed to elaborate on, on the theology of the body. Yeah. Well, the reason why it's so short, as maybe some people who have actually seen copies of the theology of the body, they'll see it's a 700 page brick. Wow. I, and it if we've uh, read it as well, then it looks, it, it, might be difficult to follow. It might have surprised some of our listeners and viewers that the last video was so short because you would imagine that, no, we would spend hours, hours upon hours uh, discussing the content. The point of this series is to go over a single audience. And that's the beauty part about the theology of the body, among many parts, I, I must say. But something very helpful when it comes to reading it because anybody can read it the audiences they're very short in and of themselves that's why the videos as you will as you will see are very short themselves jeremy and i will proceed with explaining the audiences and we will see that the videos themselves will be short because the audiences they're short and i do want to invite our listeners and viewers to not uh, let the size of the theology of the body intimidate you. You can pick up a copy and read one or two audiences every day and finish the theology of the body at your pace. And part of the goal of our series is to help you be able to do that mm -hmm. and probably notice um, accidentally misclicked on the slideshow so that's awkward but anyways that does give a preview of one of those kind of weird things that you might see so the second audience um some interesting language that jp2 uses is elo and yawist and those are weird words and that might confuse us as what is JV2 even talking about when you hear the word Yahwist or Elohist. And what we're getting, what he's getting at is um, these are references to what's called the documentary thesis, the documentary hypothesis. Um, the documentary hypothesis was originated with Julius Wellhausen in the 19th century. He was a liberal protestant biblical scholar and he proposed the documentary thesis so tradition said that the first five books of the bible the pentateuch which is genesis exodus leviticus numbers and deuteronomy were written by moses and wellhausen said no in fact he believed that moses was not even a real historical person just a made-up creation of a later biblical author now the purpose of the documentary hypothesis for wellhausen is to do something like what darwin did to biology you see in the 1600s you have newton who came up with his theories of physics you have the laws of motion. You have these neat equations to describe how things move. And Darwin wanted to do that with biology. He wanted to describe in neat principles how biology, how animals developed. And he did that through his principles of evolution. Now, Wellhausen wanted to do that with his documentary thesis. He wanted to give a scientific approach and explanation of the Bible, moving from what is simple to complex. All right. And so he proposed four sources, Guillermo. 
Oh, you're muted at the moment. Yes. Um, maybe any of us who have uh, read uh, books about the Bible might have come across these four sources. They're often abbreviated as JEDP. Now, these are, according to the thesis, the different sources that make up what's known, what we now have as the book of Genesis. Now, Pope John Paul II is going to refer to J and E overwhelmingly. Now, J, the Yahwist, in this first account of creation. And just one thing that I would like to add, just uh, as a bit of a preview for the next video, is that uh, if you're following along, reading the theology of the body, well, this audience talks about the first account of creation. That's the part of Genesis that talks about the seven days of creation. If, uh, notice that Adam and Eve, they're not there. They're, they're not mentioned by name in that first chapter of the book of Genesis. That, that comes around in the second book of Genesis. And more on that once we get to next our next episode. I don't even think Adam and Eve are mentioned in the next audience, for that matter. You're right. Okay, you're technically yeah. right. It's, you're technically right. Yeah. We will get there at some okay. point. Yes, yes, inevitably. <laughs> yeah. Can't, you can't go through the first couple books of the Bible without talking about Adam and Eve. Yeah. Let's see. So we got our... So essentially, we have four types of sources that Wellhausen proposed before. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. For um, Genesis, right? And you have the Yahwehs, Elohis, Deuteronomus, and Priestly, and they all have different emphasis. Now, this, of course, is Wellhausen's um, scheme. Um, so you have the Yahwehs, which is kind of more anthropomized view of god god's more like a more of like a human right anthropomized whereas elohes you have this more formal distinct conception of who is god the deuteronomist is going to focus on the covenants and you have the priestly author who's supposed to focus on the liturgical ceremonial laws the priesthood and this is all of course a um, construction of Wellhausen. And since Wellhausen, you've had variations of these views. I think there's another version with five sources instead of four. Mm -hmm. There's a whole history behind it. And that brings us to something for you to consider. Further resources, if you want to read about the documentary thesis. Um, Guillermo, you want to tell us a little bit about the first book, Catholic Introduction to the Bible? Yes, I have read this first source, A Catholic Introduction to the Bible, and I cannot recommend it enough. It just really uh, elaborates on the Old Testament. As we can see, this one is based on the Old Testament. And the two authors, uh, the first one, uh, Dr. The first one, uh, Dr. John Bergsma, Jeremy and I had the privilege of being his students at Francisco University of Steubenville and just absolutely spectacular professor. And Dr. Bram Petrie, uh, he, what I will say on my end for sure is that he wrote a couple of books on the Last Supper and they're both <sighs> must reads. They are both must reads. One is academic, the other one is a, a a more popularized version, both of them are uh, yeah. must reads. I insist. They are they're very good books. Another really good book of Petrie's is his The Case for Jesus. That's also a really good book. He engages a lot of the modern biblical academia in that book. So that's relevant too. Um now Dr. Bersma, Dr. Petrie, and the authors of this other book, um, Dr. Hahn, the three of them form a um, school of biblical theology as represented by the St. Paul Center at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. 
So if you really want to dive more into their thought and how they view things, there is a lot of great literature. They got a journal, Letter and Spirit, had a lot of great things in it. And so now we have this second book, right? Modern Biblical Criticism. This book, um, it's actually the second part of a series that Dr. Han wrote. Um, the first is Politicizing the Bible. These two books go through biblical criticism from 1300 to 1900, which is quite a rigorous approach. Yeah. Dr. Han did write a short book called The Decline and Fall of Sacred Scripture, How the Bible Became a Secular Book. And it's kind of an abbreviation of these two books. But if you want the full in-depth treatment, um, I know the bi modern biblical criticism books, about 300 pages. The politicizing Bibles, I think probably 500 pages. Yeah, 500-ish. Yeah. But the, the decline and fall of sacred scripture is a nice short read that takes those 800-some pages and gives you an overall picture. Um. I do want to mention, though, this book because there is a chapter on Wilhausen. So if you want to dive more and get a very good Catholic view, there is that. You do need to note that Dr. Hahn writes two types of books, the easy layman reading intro the theology books, and then he has his academic books. And these two books are more academic. So bear that in mind they will be very good resources but they might prove to be a little challenging i do highly and, recommend both oh your mom i was just gonna say and heavy yeah heavy <laughs> in more than one sense right heavy to carry around and heavy to keep it correct. in mind correct yeah all right back to jp2 we lingered enough let's see here so Genesis 1 has three characters. Okay? The first is the theological character. Now, we need to keep in mind that it is the first book of the Bible, the very first chapter. And in this, we have a progression of creation. God creates first the earth, then he water, land light day plants animals you got your well we should say the fish the birds the bugs then the animals and eventually man and we are so there's this natural progression and right before man is created there's a JP2 notes that it seems as if God halts. And then he says, let us create man in our image and likeness. And with that, we learn that man is defined in terms of relation. He's def man is defined in terms of this relation with God. And Guillermo, you had something you want to say about image and likeness? Yes. That term, image and likeness, also connotates a relationship, a, specifically a filial relationship, meaning a father and son relationship between two uh, parties. In this case, those two parties are God and man. All right. So let's see. So. We have, okay, so we have man that is, I think we're on the wrong slide, that's funny, this is the second slide, I think my mouse double clicked, all right, so we have uh, man, he's defined in terms of the visible world, and well he's not yeah so man is created with a body but he's not defined strictly in terms of the visible world and so he has this theology he has this um since man is defined in terms of image and likeness 
That means he cannot be understood strictly in terms of the visible world. There is something more to him. Okay. So let's see. Let's see if we can find the, our missing slide here. I do believe we jumped over the cosmological character. There we exactly. go. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes my mouse double clicks on me. All right. So we saw the theological character, not quite the order that JP2 presented in, but <laughs> whatever. So we have the cosmological character, right? We have the progression of creation. We learn that man is a member of the visible world. You have this halt of God. Image of likeness tells us that man is distinct from, from all creation, right? Man is placed among, in the world among the being of the created beings. So cosmological tells us that we're, we're looking at creation from the wide perspective. We're looking at the entirety of the cosmos, right? We're looking at what is man's place in the cosmos? Well, he is a created being. He belongs to the visible world, but he is special because he's made an image and likeness. He's distinct, right? So we'll jump back to the theological. All right, let's see here. I think, we, let's see here. We talked about image likeness, defined in relation, image body. Hmm. So one further thing to point out then is looking at the verse quoted in full at the top here, God created man in his own image and image he created them, male and female, he created them. From this, we can extrapolate another principle concerning male and female. Since man is made in the image and likeness of God, man as male and female are both equally image and likeness of God. So the image and likeness, that applies equally to male and female. That is asserted right here in the Bible. There's equality between male and female we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out that equality what does that mean um and most importantly the first book of the bible tells us about the objective reality of who is man what is man we're defining objectively what that is according to the very beginning of man. Um, Guillermo, did you have something you wanted to add? No, uh, no. Okay. Wasn't sure if you were on the edge of your seat waiting to say something or not. No, uh, okay. no, no, not quite. Not quite. Okay. Maybe now. So the third character is the metaphysical character. Since man, since the first book of the Bible is present or I should say the first chapter of Genesis is presenting the objective reality of man and creation, that, that is probably a metaphysical description. Man is being understood in terms of being and existing. Man is a member of the visible world. He is a being within time. He, he has a coming into existence. All these things point to the fact that man is a contingent being. That means contingent means that man is subject to change. Like at one moment you're hungry, next moment you're sleepy, and a third moment you're thirsty, right? We have these changes. We start as children, as babies, and we grow up to adults, and eventually we die. Right? These are all changes that are proper to the human person. Of course, the rest of creation has changes too. But God is distinct in that he does not change. God is unchanging. He is not a contingent being. So you get this metaphysical distinction. And then another metaphysical distinction is the fact that before man was created, God said creation was good, but 
after God created, creation is very good. This tells us then that there's a particular ontological value of the human person, an inherent dignity that's greater than the rest of creation. Man is the high point of creation. And when we take all of this, then um, one last thing to note is that man and man alone is called to be a co-ruler over creation. God is the ruler over creation. He orders creation out of chaos. And then in Genesis 1, we're told that man is to till and work. And so man, through his work, his, his tilling of the fields, he is co-ordering and ruling over creation. Let's see. And then I guess just something to note in brief is that um, this first chapter of Genesis is one of the foundational texts of Western civilization in terms of metaphysics, anthropology, and ethics. Uh, we do have um, a further point that JB2 observes is that since God created and that creation is good, St. Thomas Aquinas extrapolates the principle that being and goodness are convertible. That being and goodness are convertible. If something exists, it is good. And if something is good, then it exists. Those two terms are convertible. There's nothing that it exists that is also not good. It's an interesting, interesting proposition that St. Thomas makes. It's in the Summa Theologiae, if you want to dive into that. Um, let's see here. Is there anything we missed, Guillermo, concerning audience two? Nope. Uh, looks like we covered it very well. Okay. I know, certainly, certainly, this, this, uh, the three characters of the book of Genesis, yeah, they, they explain a lot. Yeah, I did like how he JP2 takes the first book of the or the first chapter of Genesis and he doesn't give it a strict um, interpretation of particular paradigm, right? You kind of mm -hmm. have like, well, you have this element and you have this element. It's theological, it's metaphysical, it's cosmological, it's all of these intertwine integrated together as a cohesive whole um so let's see i guess just a recap then we have in the first audience jesus refers us to the beginning he cited genesis 1 and 2 so we know beginning refers to genesis 1 and 2 and this this audience audience 2 jp2 explains the content of the first um, chapter of Genesis is the first creation account. Now, interestingly enough, he only dedicates the one audience to this, uh, uh, the, the one audience to this chapter of Genesis. The rest is dedicated to the second creation account. So we will be spending a lot of time looking into that. Jeremy, yeah. is it correct to say that in this second audience is when we first see the words theology of the body? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. In fact, it's um, in paragraph five that the very first time JP2 uses the phrase um, theology body shows up, I believe. Oh, unless I missed it somewhere, but I'm pretty certain that it is that um, paragraph five is the first. That's uh, what was that, Guillermo? I just said uh, I am too. Okay. All right. I think we're going to wrap up this video then so we don't drag it out too long. If I can find my cursor.
Thank you for watching our video. Check out our social media. We have too much social media. Except for Patreon, please give us your money. We need it to buy more books so we can do things like this. Subscribe to our YouTube. Check out our cool website. Check out our cool podcast that Guillermo has spent a lot of time putting together for us. Um, you can check out our link here, laynovellastreet.com slash subscribe. We threw a lot of things social media related on that one page. So it's all there for you to find, to enjoy, and I guess curse if you don't like social media. And of course, please be sure to share our content. I always forget to say that. Please share. And I guess another thing I always forget is also pray for us. Absolutely. Can, right? It takes yes. a lot of work doing this. All right. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. God bless. I always forget that too.